Welcome everyone. I'm Clark and I'm the producer of this channel. I'm from Lehi, Utah. I started Study My Gospel to provide another resource of online gospel learning. I partner with professional gospel instructors for our various series, including Come Follow Me, Gospel Topics, and more to come. If you like the content, please subscribe. Enjoy the video. Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. Thank you for spending a few moments of your time with me today. We will look at Helaman chapter 7 through 12. The book of Helaman describes a people who are waiting the coming of Christ. And I'll just stop that quote right there. Isn't that our day? Isn't that what our prophets are talking to us about? That we are being prepared for the coming of Christ a second time. So I'm just going to change a couple of names as I read this quote. You'll see it as you read it through with me. The book of Russell describes a people who are awaiting the coming of Christ. Their society is infiltrated by secret combinations, established by the Gadianton robbers, and was characterized by great prosperity. Prosperity led to great pride among the people, and their pride resulted in the persecution of the humble, the oppression of the poor, the mocking of sacred things, and to all manner of iniquity. The prophets Russell, Dallin, and Dieter, the German shepherd, were called to preach repentance to the people and prepare them for the coming of Christ. That seems to be very much like our day. The history, the events that are in Helaman, that are preparatory to the first coming, have many par parallels to the, our day. History is not something that if you don't understand that you're doomed to repeat it. But there are patterns in history that if you understand can help you avoid the past mistakes, learn from them, and make sure that you don't fall in the same pattern. One of the patterns that's talked about is a cycle of pride, or a pattern of pride. We're going to skip to the very end, chapter 12, that talks about this pattern, and then we're going to come back and talk about how we avoid getting in this pattern, or pride cycle, and how do we stay out. Helaman 12 really is a summary of the editor Mormon saying, you got to see this. He's going to use phrases like, thus we see, or thus we can behold. So let's look at those as we read a little bit of these verses. And thus we can behold, okay, right up front, you got to see this, says Mormon, how false and also the unsteadiness of the hearts of the children of men. Yea, we can see that the Lord in his great infinite goodness does bless and prosper those who put their trust in him. And so you see it. We may see at the very time he doth prosper his people. Then the next little part of verse 2 is, here's how God's prospering his people. And he prospers them again and again and again. And in fine, here's your summary. Doing all things for the welfare and happiness of his people. Yea, then is a time that they do harden their hearts and do forget the Lord their God. And do trample under their feet the Holy One. Yea, and this because of their ease and their exceeding great prosperity. And thus we see that except the Lord doth chasten his people. Now I pause right there. Mormon wants you to see that there is a cycle in history. So for this, get blessed, prosper, prosperous. Then there comes some pride and sin. A little bit of chastening because God wants you to be able to repent, come back, turn back to him, have some humility so you can once again be prosperous and be blessed. I like to draw this maybe a little bit different um, because there's a way to stay out of it, uh, a couple ways. So I would draw this just for me. You have prosperity and pride bring, comes in, and then pride leads to sin, and then sooner or later there's going to be a chastening. Maybe it's a gentle chastening by the Spirit. Maybe it's something that an inspired friend or leader would say to you, which brings you to be a little more humble, and then it allows you to repent or encourages you to repent, call in the name of Christ, turn back to him, and you're prosperous. But you don't want to go in that circle forever and ever. How do you stay out? Well, one of the things that these verses, these chapters are teaching is there's a way to stay out. Very simply, exercise faith in Christ, be obedient to the commandments, and have the Holy Ghost as your constant guide. It'll warn you when you're following that pride cycle, it'll keep you out. I guess I should add there's a second way to stay out of that pride cycle because sometimes people never choose to be humble. They never choose to change their ways. So they harden their hearts. And then the phrase that often is used in the scriptures, they were ripe or ripening in iniquity. 
And there are also times where the Lord says, I want to short circuit this a little bit. I'm going to send somebody and give hard counsels, something that's going to be really hard to accept. And Samuel Lamanite's going to do that in chapters 13 to 15. But that is done in a way that helps you have a little more humility and repent. So for me, this isn't just the pride cycle. This is a spirituality cycle to allow you to be able to not be in the pride cycle, but to stay out and have the Holy, Con Holy Ghost as your guide. Now, getting back to Helaman chapter 12, or 7 through 12. One of the great talks on this that I grew up with was from President Benson. Kind of the beware of pride talk given in general conference. He defined pride as enmity, which is hatred or opposition to God. Pride results in secret combinations which are built up to get power, gain, and the glory of the world. This fruit of the sin of pride, namely secret combinations, brought down both the Jaredite and Nephite civilizations and has been, the will, has been, will yet be the cause of the fall of many nations. We think, okay, do we have them today? Well, Elder Ballard said the Book of Mormon teaches that secret combinations engaged in crime present a serious challenge, not just to individuals and families, but to entire civilizations. Among today's secret combinations are gangs, drug cartels, and organized crimes families. If we are not careful, today's secret combinations can obtain power and influence just as quickly and completely as they did in the Book of Mormon. When Nephi sees these secret combinations, whatever their names are of his day, Gideon robbers or our day, gangs, drug cartels, crime families, he sees it and he sees the pride. In chapter 7, verse 6, his heart is swollen with sorrow and exclaimed in the agony of his soul. It troubles him. But then he says one of the classic statements of the entire Book of Mormon, But behold, I am consigned that these are my days. It's not a, I'm giving up, but it's a I need to be content with what God has given me today. I not only trust in God, but I trust in his timing. Like Alma, who wished for a trumpet-like voice of an angel, we too need to understand our motivations and limitations. Even so, let us use well the season in which we serve. Tolkien put it eloquently. Yet it is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what it is in us for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know, so that those who live after may have clean earth to till. What weather they shall have is not ours to rule. Nephi wished nostalgically he lived in different time, and finally concluded, but behold, I am consigned that these are my days. Should not desire more than to perform the work to which he had been called. Faith in God includes faith in his wisdom. In placing us in our particular time and place, those years wherein we are set. I guess another way for me to, to kind of express this same idea is a conversation in Lord of the Rings. Frodo has found that there is a darkness that is coming into the world. He's starting to lament and says, I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all those who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Nephi is a great example who does that. He doesn't give up but he seeks earnestly and unwearingly to do the will of God. If you want a great kind of storyline that does chapter 7 through 10, the video The Pride Cycle that the church put out in 2007, you can get it from the, the church's website, does a great job in just going that storyline. And one scene for me stands out, and it's the last one, where Nephi's identified the murderer, and people are like, oh, hey, this guy really is of God. Uh, he's a prophet. We know that he identified the killer, not because he was a part of that, but that he truly is a prophet. And then you see the scene where they divided hither and thither and went their ways, leaving Nephi alone as he was standing in the midst of them. Everyone knows who he is, but everyone goes to their home but hasn't changed. That would have to be very discouraging. Once again, Nephi is a great example for us. And if you look what the Lord says to him in chapter 10, just a couple of verses later, 
he talks about how you really can unleash the power of God in wicked times. So verse 4, Blessed are thou, Nephi, for those things which thou hast done, for I behold how thou hast with unweariness. I think if we're going to unleash the power of God or be empowered from high, we can't be weary in well-doing. We have to be with unweariness. And here's the four things he gives to Nephi. Declared the word. You've not feared the people around you. You've not worried about your own life. But you've sought the will of God and to keep God's commandments. And because Nephi, or maybe we'd put your name there. Verse 5, And now because thou hast done this with such unweariness. Behold, I'll bless thee forever, and I'll make thee mighty in word and in deed, in faith and in works, yea, even all things that should be done according to thy word. For thou shalt not ask that which is contrary to my will. At this point, it'd be really kind of a fun thing in your, in your group, just as an idea. Maybe I'm getting ahead of with my teaching ideas, and I'm not separating them very well, and I probably never do. But stop and say, okay, teenager, <laughs> if I gave you all power, how would you solve and then put a social issue in there? One that they may care about. If God gave you all power right now to solve this issue, how would you solve it? Aladdin was going to be given phenomenal cosmic powers. Well, to have three wishes. Well, genie had cosmic phenomenal powers. But isn't that what the genie says? He had three wishes. He can do anything. But more seriously... If Christ said to you, if I gave you all power, how would you solve, boom, this? And I think it all starts back from what Nephi did in preparation for, to receive these promises with unweariness. He started off with a frequent repetition in fundamental principles. He did fast and pray oft, and he waxed stronger and stronger in the humility and firmer and firmer in the faith, and the filling their soul of joy and consolation. And I pause. Not with doubt and fear. Doubt not. Fear not. But with joy and consolation. Back to the verse. Yea, even to the purifying and sanctifying of the hearts, which sanctification comes because of yielding their hearts unto God. You ever thought about what that looks like to a teenager, yielding your heart? You know, it's like, this is a yield sign going into a circle right by a high school that my daughter goes to. So I'd recorded this video and I went home and kind of talked to my daughter about it. And I said, well, what, see how close I got. What, what does it mean yield to you? And she goes, oh, this is what yield to me means. And she pulled this up on her phone. It means here's I got a little circle. Fasten your seatbelt. Speed up. Pray. Don't look back. Don't turn. Go. <laughs> I thought, yeah, well that's not what you do. You know, we joked about it. We laughed about it. But, you know, she doesn't have her driver's license yet. She's learning how to drive. She's a great driver. She sees this. She is a great driver. But if you're going to yield into traffic, you have to slow down. You have to wait sometimes longer than you want to. And you have to change the course of your vehicle. Maybe change it a little bit to get into the course of where the road is. To yield your heart to God, sometimes you have to pause a little bit, wait a bit longer than you want to. You have to change your course to go into the course of the plan that God has for your life. I have found that yielding your heart means that you adjust your course to match God's plan for you. And gratitude is the beginning of a desire to yield your heart for God. When you have that gratitude, you healed your heart the Spirit seems to re-educate your heart and your mind. It is only by yielding to God that we can begin to realize His will for us. And if we truly trust in God, why not yield to His loving omniscience? After all, He knows us, and our possibility is much better than we do. That's a quote from Elder Maxwell, and really, the Spirit re-educates your desires. Now, just some ideas in, in teaching these things uh, I hope, hopefully, that you see that the book of Helaman is written for us. It's written for a people who are waiting for Christ. And view it in that way. And as you teach it, view it that way. And just be thinking, not focusing on the pride cycle, but how do we get out and stay out of the pride cycle? And if we were saying like Nephi, these are my days. 
then what will you decide to do with your time this week? In the time that's allotted to you, are you going to be like Nephi and being unweary in what you do that blesses others and increases your faith? How will you yield your heart or merge your values and desires to align with the will of God? Thank you for spending a little bit of time with me today. Uh, look forward to uh, next week. We'll talk about the rest of the book of Helaman. But until then, have a lovely day and keep smiling.